Mark chapter 10. So what's been happening in Mark to this point as we've been traveling verse by verse through this book is Jesus is approaching the cross. He's within a few months of going down to Jerusalem and facing the cross. He knows it's coming and he's getting very serious with his disciples. He's, he's trying to get away at various different times to minister to his disciples. John the Baptist had had its head cut off and uh, the disciples had gone out on this, this mission trip and they were casting out demons, healing people, preaching uh, the message. And, and Jesus wanted to debrief, but he also knew that his time is coming and the time is short and he wants to make sure that, that all the instructions are in place for these guys. And so instead of just trying to become more popular and large, he's trying to be smaller and effective. But everywhere he goes, people surround him. And when people start surrounding him, the Pharisees come and start attacking him as well. And we've seen this play out again and again and again. Well, it seems finally, when he headed back into um, Caesarea, that the crowds kind of died off in Caesarea. And my, my belief is in Caesarea, which was kind of his home base there in Galilee area, that everybody who needed a healing had gotten healed. <laughs> And, and those that really wanted to hear the message would then come and listen to the teaching, but the crowds had died off, and he was able to spend some time with his disciples. And he really got to the heart of the matter, as we saw last week. He talked about the pride that they had. He talked about being servants to one another. And, and so we looked at that, as when, and, and he also told them, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, you've got to learn to be the servant of all. And so we looked at that last time we were together. Now, Mark chapter 10, verse 1, it reads, Then he arose from there, and he came to the region of Judea by the other side of the Jordan. And again, multitudes gathered to him as he was accustomed, and he taught them again. The Pharisees came and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife, testing him? Now, Matthew adds this, Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife for any reason? And so this was an academic argument between various different schools of thought within those who were educated in the law or the scribes. And it says here, though, clearly that they were testing him. They weren't testing him like he's going to pass a test. They were testing him to try to fail him. They would continually try to trap Jesus into some argument against the Mosaic law or against the Old Testament. They were always trying to trap him so they could point a finger at him and say, aha, he isn't the great guy that you all think he is. You see, the Pharisees had already decided that they had to do something about Jesus. They were attacking him to discredit him, not really to learn anything. It was just all a trap. And uh, so that was their heart. And so in front of this crowd, they test him. And they start asking him about divorce. Well, Jesus' response, again, is spot on. He answered and said to them, What did Moses command you? And they answered, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and dismiss her. And by asking what did they command, he was forcing them to realize Moses never commanded divorce. He permitted it for various reasons, and we're going to see that in a minute. And so this is what, excuse me, it's not on. There you go. This is what Moses had said in Deuteronomy. When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he found some uncleanness in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of the house. Now, Moses wrote this as they were going into the land to possess the land. And he spent about a month giving them the instructions in Deuteronomy. And so he's giving them the most important parts is what he's doing. Because Moses isn't going to lead them in. Remember, that's Joshua that does that. Moses isn't allowed in. And so he, this is what Deuteronomy is. And Moses shares this with the people right, in Deuteronomy. And so he allows them, they realize he allows them to do this. Now, the argument in Jesus' day by several different rabbis was, was fairly extreme. One rabbi named Shammai taught that divorce was allowed only if the wife was guilty of immorality, meaning sexual immorality. And, and it had to be basically pretty extreme. Other than that, man, you're married and you're married permanently. 
And that's the conservative view, and that's more of the view that we would take, right? Now, the other view was the other extreme, and it was by Rabbi Hillel. And he taught that if a wife did anything offensive or disagreeable, it was grounds for divorce. Remember, he has found some uncleanness in her. She doesn't know how to cook. She's gone. You know, like just craziness. So that was one of the teachings. Now, another rabbi went so far as to say if his wife wasn't, you know, dressing up well enough and trying to earn his favor enough, and he saw another woman more attractive, that would be he's found some uncleanness in her. And so they're so like male dominated garbage, right? And so they're arguing these things. There should be no argument here. And Jesus is going to point out the fact that there should be no argument in this at all, right? So again, he asks, what is a command? And then they go, well, Moses allows this. And Jesus says in verse 5, and he answers, he says to them, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote this precept. He wouldn't have had to write this precept if your heart was like God's heart. Your heart isn't like God's heart. And because you, you're, you're not forgiving like God, and you're not loving like God, and you're not protecting like God, you're not doing anything like God, that's the only reason this is allowed. Right? And so he, he puts that back on them. Now again, he's hard on them. He's hard on them. But Moses would do this because with adultery, or what it means here, uncleanness, and fornication, that is the most intimate of, of, of relations between a man and a woman, and it is so painful and so wrong that sometimes it is irredeemable, okay? And especially if the person is not repentant. And, and that can happen, okay? And so I'm not saying, oh, you know, there, there's, there's no time, right? But if there's no repentance and no unity, it is allowed in that circumstance, right? But it is so hard to get over. Now, the other side of it is this, is the person is free, absolutely free, if they are innocent. And the problem is, many times, and I'm not saying all the time, but many times when there's an adultery, even there, there's some percentage of blame, right? In, in this sense, because, you know, uh, you know, sometimes a guy will come to me, oh, she committed adultery, and then I start finding out about their relationship, and I find out that he's emotionally, uh, uh, emotionally aloof or, or just ignoring her, and um, physically he's rough with her, and, and, and spiritually it's just non-existent. He's been negligent, and he's kind of pushed her into an arm of, of someone that would pay attention to her and cherish her. <laughs> So he needs to repent of that, even though that sin, I would put the greater percentage on that sin, because it's just wrong. You're not supposed to do that. But, but, but when I'm counseling, I'm always looking for both sides, or I'm looking for both sides to be humble about their failure in their marriage. Because it takes two to tango, right? Normally. Sometimes it's not that way. And in Hosea's case, it wasn't that way. And I've run into cases where it wasn't that way. Or vice versa, the wife has completely cut off the man sexually and using her body to manipulate him, or she is continually just ripping on him, and he goes to work and he's got this secretary that's paid to respect him, but at least she does. See, see how this happens? And, and it's so common. And, 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 and that's how it happens. So, so there's, there's ways. That it, so if that marriage is going to recover, you have to have two people humble and repentant and wanting to do it God's way. And so often in the situations that I run into, I, I, I always ask this, did you guys do premarital? And I would say 99% of the time, nope, didn't do premarital. They were just trying to do it on their own. We love each other. Love is all you need. <laughs> they say that love won't pay the rent, but that's all right. You know, whatever. But it just goes on and on, right? Like, we just think we got it because we're good people. One, you're not. Two, marriage is God's institution. He created you. He knows you better than you know yourself, and he knows how you should get along, and he gave us tons of instruction on marriage, right? And it has got to be intentional and worked hard for because it is worth it, and it is a huge blessing, right? But 
you know, the, these things happen, right? And so, again, God allows it, but he does not command it. And Jesus emphasizes that by the way he asks the question. And he says, because a heart can't heal, there's times when it gets to that place where divorce will happen. And so he's challenging these guys. Now, they're just trying to trap them, but he's giving them a deeper answer. And what is he doing? He's nailing their heart because their heart is not good, right? Their heart's in a bad place. And they're just manipulating the situation, and this is just a theological... They don't really care, right? But he gets to the heart of the thing. And then he goes on. In verse 6, he says, But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Christian, God makes man male and female. Enough said. The, the, the craziness going on in our culture today. Now, people struggle with all kinds of things. And guys, I counsel people compassionately that, that struggle with things. This world racks people up and messes them up. And if someone wants to hear God's word and be ministered to with God's truth and his spirit and loved on by this church, it doesn't matter how messed up they are. They just need to be willing but we're all messed up, right? We come in broken and God heals us. I, I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about this died in the wall trying to decide that God didn't make humankind male and female. That's the end of the argument for me. God made them male and female, right? And then it says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. And then Jesus adds, so then they are no longer two but one flesh. So he's quoting the Old Testament. Then he comes back to the New Testament. He says, they're no longer two but one. So he says it twice. And then he says, therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. So Jesus goes back to the very beginning. And he states that the first marriage was a model for marriage, male and female getting married. Now, he doesn't go back to some of the patriarchs that collected some of the, the traditions around them where they'd have multiple wives like kings in ancient days or rich people in ancient days were. He doesn't go back to Solomon as an example. Who does he go back to? Adam and Eve, the way he designed it. Male, female, married. One to one. Now, in Genesis... Um, 2.21, it says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, and he closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. So men, man and woman were actually created at the same time. A woman was just formed later. Now, if God hadn't taken the womanly part out of man... Man would have represented God fully himself, but part of man was taken out, and it's different. It's woman and man. Have you guys noticed that men and women, in general, are pretty different? Not just physically, not just emotionally, but also spiritually, right? We're very different. And therefore, when men and women are together, they fully represent God. Not just in marriage, but in the church. Women represent half of God's personality and flavor in the church. And so men aren't to be afraid of women and shove down their ministry. But men are also supposed to stand up and take half of the ministry of the church as well and do what they're called to do. And so there's an incredible balance where the church represents God fully. Both sides are equally important. Okay? And, and, and it's just so important. Right? And, and so... They were taken apart and, and made differently so that they could bless one another with their differences and represent God more fully as they're united properly. So there's an old proverb that says, God didn't take woman from his head that she should rule over him. Or from his foot that he should step on her, but from his rib that they should be side by side. And this is true. It's complementaryism between male and female. We work together to the glory of God. Now, the story goes, one night Eve was a little jealous of Adam, and she's thinking, I think he's seeing another woman. <laughs> and she was kind of freaking out. Adam woke up in the middle of the night. She was counting his ribs. <laughs> 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 
she was the only one. One man, one woman designed that way by God. Okay? And it's gracious that God would put up with some of the craziness that happened throughout the scriptures, right? But this is God's best design. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and he shall be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Therefore, or since the woman was taken from a man, they are to be back together, working together to bring the fullness of God together. Since man lost that, man also needs woman and woman needs man. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Now that is important because it doesn't mean just naked physically, it means emotionally and spiritually. And there's a lot of work that goes into effort into marriage to love each other to such a point that you're, you're intimate and you've also made that choice by God to love that person no matter what, even as you get older, through good times and bad, right? It is, it is agape love, the love of choice, the love of will that also is the foundation for every other type of love to experience. And so they were intimate with one another, emotionally, physically, and spiritually, and unashamed. Now we're going to see that this relates to God and his church, and God in the Old Testament and his people, the people of Israel, before Israel existed, God and those who follow him, those that we know as the patriarchs, right? And so God wants us to have intimacy without shame before him as well. Intimacy without shame. God knows us and still loves us. And that this is a beautiful thing. But for us within marriage and us getting along in the church, it requires grace and a choice of the will. Grace and a choice of the will. I can say most of the time I feel like loving my wife. I can tell you all the time I love my wife. And I, I can tell you sometimes I don't feel like loving my wife. But I still love her. I'm still committed to her. Even though the feeling or the phileo type love isn't always there. Now I'm willing to bet if she says it about me, that percentage of phileo love for my meal, because I'm a little harder to, a little more unruly than she is. But she has made that choice. And God has made the choice to love us as well. It's his will that says, I will love you through thick and thin. And then again in verse 8, it says, the two shall become one flesh. And then Jesus repeats himself. So then they are no longer two, but one. And he wants to emphasize this. Now, when you are married, and when I do marriage counseling, um, I always tell people, you, you, you can't win an argument when you're married. And, and get that out of your mind. Because you're one. And God calls you one. And if you win, the other's lost. And if they win, you've lost. Right? And I believe, in general, men represent the strength of God and women represent the beauty of God. And if a man wins, he's used his strength to beat down the beauty. And if the woman wins, she's become ugly to beat up her strength. Right? You don't win. You communicate to resolve. That's what I always say. You communicate to res resolve. You cannot win an argument because half of you will lose. And so it's a zero-sum game to try to win. To resolve is the only way to win, right? And so he says they're no longer two, but one. Now understand this. Jesus says this twice. And so this is why divorce is so destructive. And many of you guys have experienced divorce. And even what they call an amicable divorce or an amiable divorce is never easy. It might be compared to other ones that are like Vietnam divorces or whatever, but it's still the dissection of a single organism. You guys understand? How does that work? Can you imagine going to the doctor and say, I'm one, but I'd like to be two now? And him taking the scalpel and trying to cut you in half and have each half of that live without any damage. It's, it's, 
it is always damaging for, for, for that divorce to take place. And, and, and there's, there's blood and guts emotionally, spiritually, and, and, and physically there's a loss of that, that companionship. And I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's hurtful for everybody around. And I've never been through a divorce, not my parents, or not myself personally, but I've been through a lot with you guys. And, and it's the children and everybody attached to you hurts with you. It's so hard, right? And here's the thing. God would, would love for us never to go through that. He would love that. But the fact is, we always make everything more complex because we're sinners, right? God says it, and then we sin and blow it up and it becomes crazy, <laughs> right? And, and so the two become one flesh. So how do you protect that within marriage? Well, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. I call these the hedges of protection around that marriage relationship. And that marriage relationship needs to be protected, even from children. That marriage relationship is yours. The children eventually will grow up and hopefully leave. Not hopefully like in a bad way, but grow up and mature to where they become adults, healthy adults, right? So, what's left? It's you too. The first institution is marriage. He created man and woman, then he created marriage. Before governments were ever established, marriages are the foundation of every government. And once marriages are destroyed, the government starts to fall apart. What's happening in our country? The family starts falling apart. What's happening in our country? Why? Marriage is attacked all the time. All the time. And if the world attacks marriage, guys, double down on marriage. Make yours as better, as best it can be. Because you're in, a, you're in a good spot. You go against what the world wants you to do. Because Satan wants to destroy marriage because he knows the best way to destroy our culture and our country and our freedoms is to destroy marriages, period. Just get rid of them, change the rules, whatever. Everything goes, right? So... You have these hedges of protection, physically one. Obviously, you know, sexual intimacy is important, but it's also the other interactions of physical life. You're united in your finances, in your vision, the house you live in, you know, these things. You're sharing physical life together. And that doesn't always happen, right? Emotionally one, you're seeking to meet one another's needs, accepting weaknesses and encouraging strengths. My, my wife and I are radically emotionally different. You know, she owns her emotions. She has a bunch of them. She's good with them. She embraces them. And I'm like, here's me emotionally. I'm over here, right? And it's just so different. But I encourage her to have good friends, too, because I can't meet all those needs. And, and her relationships with her daughters are great because she's, she works there. But really, we do sit down and we do talk. And she lets me know. I don't feel like you're listening. And what do I do? Really? <laughs> you know, like, because I'm not good at it, and I, I, I need to hear it. But then if she's telling me that, I need to listen, because emotionally I need to be united, and my wife needs to feel protected from me emotionally. Okay? But spending time together, talking out things like future plans, current problems, building friendships together, spending time outside of the regular schedule together. I like, I, like, uh, I like playing disc golf. So I was watching the world championships yesterday. And so I'm telling my wife, like, on the, on the last hole, this guy threw in a disc from 200 feet right into the hole, tied up the match, and they had to go into a playoff. And I'm like, wow, whoa, honey. And I'm telling her all that, and she's going, yeah, yeah. You know what she cares? Zero. But that was her effort. I commend you, honey. That was great. You, you put effort into emotionally getting excited with me about something you didn't care about. But it's effort, right? <laughs> and then spiritually one. Spiritually one. Praying together. Worshiping together. Discussing things of God together. Sharing spiritual insights with one another and having spiritual goals as a couple. And I tell you what, my wife and I approach the scriptures completely differently, too. But we share our insights with one another, so I get to learn from her even as she learns from me. 
right? And, and we can have these discussions and, and everything, but it's this time praying and going to the Lord together. And so these are the hedges of protection that are, are so important. And I dare say, with the Lord, physically, are you trusting the Lord? Or you just come to church and then you do everything physically on your own. You, you, your job's all yours. You don't really involve God in your job or your, your finances or anything else. But do you trust God with all that? Because are you all in or are you partially in? Right? And so we have this relationship with God as well. And so you protect it and you're very purposeful about it. So unity is important. As you grow older, you want to become more united if you're married. A young man saw an elderly couple sitting down at McDonald's, and he just thought it was so amazing. They ordered just one meal, and he sat there and he watched them as they cut the hamburger in half, and they counted out the fries, and then they got two cups, and they shared the drink together. And he thought, that's so precious, but he noticed it was kind of weird. He noticed it was like, they're not eating at the same time. And he goes up to him and he goes, you know what? You know, one, I'd like to buy you guys a meal. I mean, I, I love watching you guys share everything, but if you don't have enough money to buy a meal, I'll buy it for you. They're like, no, no, we've shared everything our whole life, you know, and, and we really enjoy doing this. But then he asks, he goes, so how come you guys aren't eating together? And she looks at him and he goes, well, it's his turn to use the dentures. <laughs> My wife has good teeth, mine are falling out, so I think I'll always have the, the dentures, right? But anyway, so you want to protect this unity. And you want to face the trials of this life together, watching each other's back. Because unfortunately, a lot of marriages who don't do it God's way and are not committed to doing God's way, are not putting a lot of effort into God's ways, who've not said, okay, he is a referee and he's right all the time about our marriage. It's not me or you, it's him. He's right about our marriage, right? If you're not doing it that way, you're going to spend more time being the trial than fighting trials together. And sometimes the other person is, is your main trial in life. It should not be that way. You work on it and you purposefully do things to become more united. And you face the enemy together instead of making each other the enemy. And the best place to start, statistically, is prayer. Pray together. Again, in our relationship with God, how are you going to be intimate with God? You read his word, but you also pray. You don't just read about him, you interact with him. Okay? Matthew 18, 19, again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them. My Father in heaven, by my Father in heaven, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. You, you have an automatic, if you're married, you have an automatic prayer partner there. 1997 Gallup uh, poll done by the National Association of Marriage Enhancement. It showed the divorce rate among couples who pray together regularly. The divorce rate is one out of 1,152. For those couples, Christian couples that are going to church on a weekly basis, it's one out of six. You know what that tells us? Over 90% of those that are married and Christian do not pray with each other on a regular basis. Okay? But you want to start out divorce-proofing your marriage? It's, it's less than 1%. Less than 1%. It's one thousandths. And even less than that, right? One out of a thousand, 152 when people pray together on a regular basis. I'm so serious about this that when couples refuse to pray together when I'm doing their counseling, I'll say, come back when you start praying together. Like, literally? Are you kidding me? Like, you're, you're not going to do the most basic, most important thing, and you're asking me to care more about your marriage than you're willing to. Pray together. Oh, but it's hard. Get over it. Pray together. Pray together. And it's not natural. Oh, but it's so hard. You, got, you, you just got to do it. And you got to keep on fighting for it. And you got to keep on reminding each other. And then you'll forget about it. And why is prayer so important? Can you pray to God and be proud? Not very long if you're really praying. Sometimes people pray at God. They're not really praying with God. 
right? But humility, it's hard to pray a proud prayer very long to a God who knows everything, right? And there's been times when I've like, I'm going to take a walk, you know, I'm frustrated, uh, we're having a, a heated discussion to resolve our conflict, and I'll tell him, I'm going to take a walk. But as I start the walk, man, I'm complaining to God. By the time I come back, I'm asking for forgiveness. And that's what happens, right? Prayer. Forgiveness. When you pray, it's like you start to realize, man, I need to forgive, and I need to seek forgiveness. It's what happens naturally. We're told in Matthew 6 that if you do not forgive, you're not forgiven. It's a pretty serious topic, isn't it? When you pray, pray thankfulness about your spouse. Some things will never change, but your attitude can towards them. And God can give you that thankful, appreciative heart. And that happens in prayer. Intimacy, when you pray with one another, you're sharing your heart to your God in front of someone else. That is spiritual intimacy. You can have emotional intimacy, you can have physical intimacy, but you can also have spiritual intimacy when you pray with your spouse. And that is so important. Unity. You're united under God's goals for your marriage when you pray with your spouse and you involve God in your problems. He wants you to offload on him. It offers hope and the list could go on and on and on. But these are some of the, the basic ones. Again, verse 9. He's telling him this. What did Moses allow? This is what God did in the very beginning. Man, woman, marriage. And he says, therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Bible tells us in Malachi 2.16, I hate divorce. Again, why? Because he doesn't like destruction of his people. And it's always painful and it always hurts. And many of you know what I'm talking about. And when your parents divorced, it hurts you. If your children divorce, it hurts you. And if you have friends that go through a divorce, it hurts, doesn't it? It, it just hurts. It's a very painful time, right? So why does God hate divorce? He doesn't like people to hurt. Secondly, marriage is, also, is supposed to be one of God's great pictures to describe his relationship with us. It's an incredible illustration, and it's a witnessing tool for the kingdom of God. And God doesn't like it when his illustrations are blown up. For example, remember when Moses was out in the wilderness and the first time they were begging for water, he strikes the rock and water comes out. That rock is Jesus Christ. The second time he's told to speak to the rock, not strike it. And what does he do? He strikes it a second time. He blew God's illustration. He wasn't allowed to go into the promised land because he blew an incredible illustration. And marriage is an illustration of God's love to man. Old Testament, who's the husband? God, right? Who's the wife? Israel. New Testament, who's the groom? Who's the bride? The church, right? It's his illustration. And in the Old Testament, it says God has planted eternity in their hearts. And if you think about it, when, Jesus, when it says of Jesus in Hebrews chapter 12, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. This is a love story. For the joy that was set before him. What did he see set before him? You. Being saved and being able to spend eternity with him. Because without him, you would not be able to be with him for eternity. And so he had this joy, to, he had this joy, he looked forward and he decided that you were worth it to go to the cross. And he rescued us as our hero. We were worth it. Okay? Now, this is amazing because if you, if you look throughout all of history, in every continent, through every culture, through all time, what is the most common story? It always goes like this. Knight in shining armor rescues damsel in distress, and she is his reward. Isn't that the most common story? Throughout all of history, and on, it doesn't matter, red, yellow, black, and white, God has planted 
eternity in their hearts. I think the marriage relationship, the romance relationship, is an example of this. And to even go further, every little boy for Halloween wants to be what? Superhero, cowboy, policeman, fireman, whatever. And then you add the modern day stuff with all the vampires and all that, whatever. You know, but, but for the most part, if you don't let them be that, man, they want to be a hero, right? They want to conquer. They, men identify with what we accomplish, okay? And little girls, what do they want to be? Princesses, some type of princess. They want to be appreciated for what they are, right? And lo and behold, you got Matthew, or excuse me, Ephesians chapter 5. Wives, submit to or respect your husbands. We want respect, right? That's, we're little boys in big bodies, aren't we? <laughs> and women, our cats in human bodies, okay? Let's just be fair. <laughs> Anyways, so, but you have this relationship, don't you? You have this relationship. And, and, and the love songs. I would climb any mountain, swim across the deepest sea. If that's what it takes you, baby, to realize something. I don't know, I don't know what song. I think it's Aerosmith or somebody, but... Right? It's always, I'm going to go, I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to fight for you. I'm, you're worth it. So, wives respect your husbands. Husbands love or cherish your wives. If men are at an airport and they got delayed a couple hours and they want to read a book, 90% of the time, what kind of book are they going to pick up to read? Action adventure? Right? Hero, conqueror, courtroom conqueror, cowboy, whatever, western. 90% of the time, more than 90% of the time, what is a woman going to pick up? Love story, romance, swept off her feet by the hero who comes along and sweeps her off the feet. But listen, that's not a bad thing. It's the way God designed us. And what did, what did Jesus do? He came along as our knight in shining armor and we the church had a need and he felt like we were worth it and he loved us enough and he chose to go through what he went through because he loved us. And we are his reward. How crazy is that? But it is, it is this perfect picture and this is what marriage exemplifies to this world. It is a witnessing tool and it is written on people's hearts. And they try to deny it, push it away, shove it down, destroy it in any way they possibly can. But they're inspired by Satan and they don't even think he exists. But he has that ability to take them down that road, right? But it is so important, your marriage. And even if you're not married here today, again, it so relates to our relationship with God. But two, if marriages are strong in the church you attend, in the city in which you live, and the country in which you live, you are better off even if you are single. Okay? It just it makes the culture stronger. So he loves us. He is committed to us. He sacrifices for us. He desires to rescue us. Don't blow God's illustration. He hates it. He hates divorce. And then it goes on in verse 10 in Mark chapter 10. It says, In the house his disciples also asked him again about the same matter. And so he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And so he's saying, This is very serious. You deal with this very seriously. Now Matthew records another ex or an actual exception it says and i say to you whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery so sexual immorality or fornication or sex outside of the marriage commitment is fornication and so he allows this to take place does he command it no again there's normally two sides to the story so whenever this happens, yes, it's, it's heartbreaking and everything else. 
but i don't recommend it i say you're going to have an incredible testimony if you can pull this back together because unfortunately a lot of people go through the same thing that you've gone through and you're going to be able to minister like crazy and you know what this is a wake-up call and if you really take it like a wake wake-up call and you go full on and, tr and decide to do it god's way and not your own way your marriage might and will likely be way better than it ever has been before, even though this tragedy took place. Romans 8, 28, God works all things for the good. As you, as you hand it to him, he can do that in your life, but it takes two people that are willing to do it, and sometimes it's only one person, and it ends up in divorce, and that's tragic, and it's a bummer. God still loves you just as much as he ever has, and you're still going to grow from the circumstances and through all the hurt as well, okay? But the, 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 the greater thing is for both involved in that to work together for the glory of God. Now, there's also other exceptions in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 15. And it's talking about this, these, all these people started getting saved in Corinth, and sometimes their spouse wouldn't get saved. And if their spouse didn't want to be married to a believer, they would say, yeah, go ahead and let them leave. It's okay. And in that case, you can actually remarry or you're free in that instance, right? So then there's another exception, but Jesus didn't mention that exception. But, um, but um, uh, Paul did. And that principle is called abandonment. Now, again, it looks very straightforward on the surface, right? Well, if they leave, they leave, you know. But, but here's the thing. What happens so often in marriage is, is you, 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 you have this couple married together and, and let's just say the, the wife divorces the husband, but the husband's emotionally, spiritually, and sometimes physically abusive to the wife, and she ends up leaving and goes, she left me. She's probably not even a believer. I'm free to remarry. Who abandoned who first? Maybe not physically. She abandoned you, but emotionally, spiritually, you abandoned her, and you forced her out. So it gets really weird, doesn't it? It gets complex, and it gets crazy. And so as much as we'd like to see it as cut and dried, guys, just realize, I'm so glad we have grace because grace works out everything. You know, and, and, and you've got to learn how to apply grace to the situation. But here's the thing, and, th and this is how, how I deal with it. And again, people will judge me and how I deal with it, but for me, it's a reality. For many of you, it's just a theory, Okay. But I have to counsel couples, and maybe they've been divorced and then remarried or whatever, right? But the thing is, what I'm looking for in someone is how they feel about their divorce. Are they just like, yeah, whatever, she was a flake. And I, I want to marry this babe now. Come on. Do, I'm, I'm just like, no, I ain't doing your wedding. And there's been people that have been divorced from what the Bible would say is a biblical manner, but I don't know the details. And this person is so flippant about marriage, I'm like, I do not want to be involved in this marriage. They can go get married by someone else, but I'm not going to put my stamp of approval on that marriage because I, I think that's dishonoring to marriage. If they don't take the grace of God seriously, if they're not humbled about their previous relationship, if they don't take response, any responsibility whatsoever, they're just like, eh, whatever. If they're not taking the grace of God and the humility of God and the forgiveness of God seriously, I won't touch it with a 10-foot pole. But when they're brokenhearted and repentant before God and the grace of God is covering them, that's when I'll consider it. But every time that I've refused to do someone's marriage, they've, they've divorced within a few years. Because God, I don't have this great gift of discernment, but one thing God is serious about in my life is you don't lay hands on a marriage. It shouldn't be, you know, and, and I'll give you discernment on that. And it doesn't happen often, but every so often it does happen. And, and they're just taking their vows, just eh, whatever. You know, when it says God hates divorce, yeah, whatever. But I've been divorced five times, you know, and it's good. I'll just get married again. And I'm like, I, I don't know. I, I don't think so. So that's how I kind of work through all these admonitions because I don't know what's happening behind the scenes, right? And I don't know what's going on. And, and someone was asking me this morning, how many sessions do you normally do? And sometimes we have to speed them up and everything, but how many sessions do you normally do for premarital? We do eight. And that's probably an hour and a half at least each session. And we want people to know that they know that they know. And even when we do their wedding, they're not ready. Right? It's just, it's a lot of work. 
But you've got to be intentional and you've got to do it God's way and you've got to understand the humility and the grace of God involved in this because there's so many things going on behind the scenes. Again, the Lord is very straightforward and simple and we mess it up and we make everything all complex and messy, don't we? And so, yeah, it's, it's rough and, and I'm, I'm judged for marrying this person but not marrying this person or whatever it is. But again, I, I, I've got to uh, really seek to try to understand the fullness of it. And many times, I, I just really have to go to prayer to see if I can be involved in some of these things. But understand this at the same time, I've never, ever recommended divorce. But there's two extremes that I've been involved in. I've known the abuse that's taken place in the marriage. And I've told the person that is seeking a divorce, you know what, we're going to walk through this with you. We love you. We just, we're praying for it to still work out, but we still love you. And there's other times when I've gotten together with the elders and we've had to write a letter and tell the person that is divorcing the other person, you're not allowed to go to any church, not just this church. And in 1 Corinthians, that's called casting someone to Satan because they're just totally blatantly disregarding the standards for marriage in the scriptures. And they're divorcing for absolutely no reason just other than lust and flesh. And um, seen that, uh, had to do that four times uh, since I've been in spiritual leadership for 30 years. So we take it very seriously and we try to take the time to walk through it, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a complex world out there. And so there's those two extremes where we're like, okay, you're not gonna go under church discipline and we're gonna love you and kind of understand, but I, I still have never recommended divorce, ever, in any circumstance. Now. You know, if there's abuse, I don't think you're meant to be, sit there and allow someone to sin against you by beating you up or anything like that. Absolutely not. You know, so we recommend separation in a safe place and filing of charges in that instance for sure, right? But I've never gotten to the point of recommending divorce, but I do understand there's very complex situations and there's a lot of hard hearts out there. But because of the hard hearts, sometimes these things can happen. Now, you know the story about Hosea. The Lord tells this man to go marry a woman that's a prostitute. And why does he tell him to do that? Because he wants to show an illustration of the nation of Israel. And what happens when Hosea marries Gomer, the prostitute? They get along fine, right? All we need is love. You know, we're good. Have a few kids. But her, her, her old nature sneaks back in and she starts to go out and prostitute herself. Multiple times, Hosea has to go out and rescue her back. And what is that? That's an illustration of God's love for his people. Hosea 2.19, he says, I will, with, I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice and loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord. This is the Lord's persistence towards us. And so the Lord loves us and he is committed to love us. And even when we fail and turn our back on him, he continues to love us. And this is important to understand God's love towards you. Now, the interesting thing, he tells husbands to love your wives like Christ loved the church. If your wife is having a bad day, are you still supposed to love her just as much? Right? You are. And the interesting thing is God has given us as men that ability to, to go against our own emotions. More so than women, because women have larger emotions, more emotions, more in-depth emotions, and they're okay with their emotions. They embrace their emotions, and they watch cry movies. <laughs> Men's emotions are like four. They're this small, and we avoid them like the plague. But it's a good thing also because this is what allows men to do these things that are manly. Duty, honor, courage, sacrifice. Right? Semper Fi, whatever. You know, it's like, this is what we are supposed to do spiritually. And so my wife, if she's having a bad day, I'm supposed to be her hero. I'm not supposed to allow her bad day to bring me down. I want to be her hero. I want to be a superhero. 
It's so funny, my, during COVID, we got hooked on a SEAL team, right? And SEAL team is, you know, these Navy SEALs, and they go out and do all this radical stuff. And so we, we watched it, and my wife's like, I want to meet a SEAL team member. They're heroes, you know? And so I have a group of pastors that, again, we, we meet with politicians, and we try to bring forth uh, m- biblical morality into our government, and we meet with them. And we're kind of behind the scenes and covert about it. We're not like trying to get in the newspaper or anything, but we want to meet with them personally. And conservative or liberal, whatever, we do it to everybody, right? We want to, to do that. So I tell my wife, I'm a spiritual te- SEAL team member. <laughs> you know? I want to be a hero. Come on, right? But we do have that ability, man. It's like, I'm a giant, man. I got a passion. You know, get over yourself. You're a man first. And God has called you to love, to love, and, and, and make a choice against your own emotions, to love like he loves you. And when you have a bad day, he doesn't turn his back on you, right? And just like Gomer and Hosea, he said, I'm still going to love you. I'm still going to love you no matter what. And finally, one of the key ingredients to a lasting marriage is forgiveness, It says in Ephesians 4.32, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ Jesus forgave you. Has Jesus forgiven you? Has he continued to be patient with you? Right? Absolutely. I'm going to go ahead and look at Ephesians chapter 5, and we all know that as the kind of the marriage chapter. But Ephesians chapter 5, he's been talking from verse 22 all the way to 29, about husbands and wives. And then in verse 30, he says, For we are members of his body, of his flesh and his bones. We are one with him. And then he says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. We've heard that before today, right? This is a great mystery in verse 32, but I speak concerning what? Christ and the church. You don't have to guess at this metaphor. He lays it out right in front of our face. The marriage and and the intimacy and the relationship between man and a woman represent God and his relationship to mankind. And and, and he loves us uh, in that way, consistently, faithfully, sacrificially. He loves us. He's not going to give up on us. And it says, nevertheless, let each of you, in particular, so love his own wife as himself, and Jesus does that faithfully, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. That's for us to respect God, to look up and just go, thank you. You love me so much that you sacrificed for me. You value me. And that is so important in this day and age, especially we as a church, as we're moving forward, We don't want to be a compromised church. But for me to move forward in this crazy world that's trying to tell me I'm this, that, and the other, you know what? Jesus doesn't think that about me, and that matters more than anything else. This world is telling me I'm a horrible person because of the pigment of my skin. Now, the problem is, I've been out in the sun for 47 years surfing, and I'm darker than a lot of Hispanics I know. (laughs) So what does that really matter? My personality has changed and I become better because I have more freckles. It matters nothing, guys. What matters is God's opinion about me and the character that God is developing in me. That's what matters in you too. And if you're identifying primarily on the color of your skin or your gender or your chosen gender or your sexual identity, poor you. Because I don't even identify as a male primarily, or a husband, or a father. I identify as a child of God. God, creator of the universe, knows all things, all powerful, sustains all things. Everything in this earth was made for him, and he loved me so much that he was willing to die for me. Thank you. (laughs) Thank God. Because this is my identity. Don't forget that, guys. 
And you will not compromise in this world that's trying to force you to compromise. And if someone cancels me, okay. God didn't cancel me. He died for me. That's your pettiness. That's your stupidity. That's your weakness. That's your shallowness. The color of our skin is skin deep. Ah, that's where you get the saying. But your character lasts forever. Walk with God. Love him. See people based upon God's love for them. And you know what the hard thing is? These people that are trying to do this to us, God wants us to love them. How are you going to do that? You're his child first. And he tells us to do that. And so by loving God, I'm told to love people and pray for them. Right? And that's the only way I can do it. Because in my flesh, I can't do it. But it all comes back. Everything comes back to that intimacy with God before anything else. And if you're married... Work on your marriage. Be purposeful. Because you are a witness for the kingdom. If you're divorced, understand, you're still married. Or if you're single, you are married. You're married to God. And you're, you're to respect him and to love him and to respond to him and be a blessing to him. He sees you as his reward. Are you? I want to be a reward. I actually want to be one. Right? And this is how we're to respond to God. But make sure your identity is absolutely wrapped up in that relationship that you have with him. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, we thank you for your word once again and just this radically important message. Worship team, I'm going to ask you to stop. Sorry, God, I'm in the middle of a prayer. We're just going to close the service because I went long. Surprise. <laughs> but next week is the 4th of July, so I encourage you guys to come out. But let's finish praying. Dear God, we just uh, pray for our, our fellowship. And just, Lord, may, may we respond to you well. Lord, you are our hero. And we are your reward. Lord, may we be your reward. May we be a sweet-smelling sacrifice unto you, God. Lord, may it be that we are productive, whether single, whether married, that we're productive for the kingdom, Lord, we pray, for such a time as this.